Vishal, great to see you, mate. Great to talk to you. This is a big day for Facebook as a company with a complete rebrand. Explain to me in your words, why are we rebranding Facebook? Yeah, you know, in, in many ways, the, the rebrand today uh, reflects uh, the last couple of years of thinking, which is Facebook as a company was more than just social media. Actually, a couple of years ago, we rebranded to be a slightly different word mark, but still Facebook. And there was some confusion, you know, uh, Instagram from Facebook, is Facebook the company, is Facebook the product? And really, we've been more than the Facebook product for, for quite some time. And so this is really signaling two mm. things. It's signaling one, that we are more than just a social media company, more than just the Facebook app, certainly. But two, that we are running towards a future, a future that we're really excited about, the next platform, which is the metaverse. And so is it safe to say for people that might be reading headlines today that Facebook changes name, that the average user won't see this name other than perhaps, you know, in that little boot up logo on, on other apps, you might see Instagram from Meta as opposed to from Facebook. But as a product name, everything else stays the same. So the products that, that people love today, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, those names don't change. Uh, they will be from Meta, which is the parent company. But the Meta brand, uh, our company brand, we, we don't expect to be you know, a, a quiet brand. It will be a consumer brand in the way many other consumer brands work today. A lot of our, our hardware will be, will be branded uh, Meta uh, in the same way that, that you might expect from another hardware manufacturer. I think the, the brands that people expect and love today absolutely will remain the same. We still have a Facebook app. It's still called Facebook. Uh, but the Meta brand will be the, the overall brand controlling both the, the media, social media products as well as the, the next computing platform will go. Now, the biggest challenge you've got in your role, um, and it's a, it's a lofty role of vice president in this area, what is the metaverse? It is, uh, it is the most important question uh, that everyone's certainly asking now. The way I'm explaining it is the metaverse is the successor to the mobile internet. It, it's not a new internet, but it's a new way of interacting with the internet. If today we look at the internet, in the metaverse, we are in the internet. What that means is we have this idea of presence that we are, in, you know, inside a space and not just alone, but with other people. Right now, you and I are happily chatting across a, a giant ocean, but I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm in the same space as you. We, we simply are looking at mm. glowing rectangles on the screen and there isn't really a sense of, of presence. And I think the last 18 months have taught us that sometimes we can't be together physically, but we would love to have a way to, to feel together and right now we can't quite do that with the technology of today so get fast forward um five years ten years what would a simple one-on-one -on -one catch up like this look like it might be a a, a parent and grandparent it might be children and, and their mates what does a catch-up look like in the metaverse well i think there's a there's an easier way to think about this today with a set of paradigms we understand like like a like a living room or a room in your home where you, you will bring people in to, to have a conversation. I think there'll be digital equivalents of those spaces. Um, but, you know, this is a digital space, so it doesn't have to follow the rules of physics in the same way a, a room might follow the rules of physics today. The thing is, this is years out to be at, at massive scale for everyone to understand, but we're starting to get glimmers and, and hints of this even today. So we actually have a product called Horizon Workrooms that we, we launched a couple of months ago for VR and you, you can get into a space and have a conversation with someone and it's a stylized avatar. It doesn't necessarily look like you and me as we look mm. right now, but because we see head movements, because we see body language, because there's spatial audio where I know where you're, the sound is coming from, you feel like you're there, even though you know you're not. And it's it's quite different than a, than a video call. And fortunately it's a bit hard to explain that until you feel it and I, I you know today we are not at the scale where everyone can explain and, and, and feel that yeah. but but that's the vision so i mean i think the the one-on-one -on -one or the, the the zoom call um example is the one that we're most used what's your best example of a um of a big picture of the metaverse in terms of i guess existing in the metaverse uh transactions uh buying and selling why do we need the metaverse when we've got the real world to buy and sell and create fashion and, and digital products. Yeah, to be perfectly clear, I, I don't think of the metaverse, we don't think of the metaverse as a replacement for the physical world. Um, I think there's there's no replacement for being there with someone or transacting with someone in the physical world. But we are increasingly spending more of our time in digital spaces. And whether that's transacting online, meeting online, doing work online, and we think those experiences can be better. 
The thing I'm most excited about actually are the next generation of businesses, creators who will build digital native products, goods, services, and make them available to people to buy so that they can build a living for themselves because maybe they wouldn't have been able to take their art or take their craft and turn that into a business in, in the world we live in today. So this is the, the, the ambition that we have, but also recognize that this is not something that, that we, Meta, a company formerly known as Facebook, we, Meta, can build alone. Uh, and that's why we're talking about it as early as we are, because we're partnering with other companies, having the conversation broadly with consumers, with, with press, with, with regulators, with, with privacy advocates, because it's important to establish some of those norms early. If, if it's not today and it's years away, how far away is it? Like how, how many years away is this different interaction, this different existence in the digital space? I think the full vision of what we shared today at, at Connect as, as our, at our conference is five, 10, maybe even 15 years into the future. But a lot of the underlying experiences that we're talking about are gonna start launching in early VR experiences, early AR experiences, augmented reality, but also across other devices. I, I don't think, we don't believe that the metaverse will be experienced on those devices alone. And so we're also thinking about how they might show up on phones and on computers, uh, because if we want to achieve the ability for you and I to spend time together and you have a headset and I don't, it would be a shame if those experiences were limited to a, mm. to a piece of hardware. How, how do you begin the process now of building this future with things in mind that you've learned over the last few years, like privacy, uh, data protection? You know, there's a lot of things that we've learned through the evolution of the internet how do you bring those in and make sure that the, the thing that we end up with, whatever it is, is something that's actually beneficial to society? I mean, this is exactly why we're talking about it so early uh, for, for a few reasons. One, again, we don't think Facebook meta should be building any of this alone. We'll be building it with other companies. We'll be building it with, with, with the public more broadly. Two, we have to talk about it early enough so we can establish some of the norms and work through some of the challenges early before things get to real scale. These things don't work, and we've learned in the last 10 or 15 years, we cannot retrofit some of these norms after the fact. So whether it's about how data is being used, giving people control, being having transparency, understanding the implications of the decisions that we're making, we learn those along the way, both as a company and frankly, as a society. And this is why we are talking about this as early as we are and committing to, to asking those questions much earlier than we did in our past. I think there's obviously been a lot of questions today about timing. Um, you know, things, words like data, privacy, um, personal privacy. Um, there's a lot of things that resonate around Facebook in a negative sense. And the idea of rebranding the company when you're in the midst of things like, you know, Senate inquiries and whistleblower outrage and those kind of things, it doesn't look good. H how do you answer to that? Well, I, I appreciate the question because clearly the timing uh, is, is a question that many people have. At the same time, anyone that's been through a rebrand or has seen a rebrand like this understand that it's not something we execute in a couple of weeks. This takes many, many months of planning to, to get to a place that we are in today. But also we aren't, um, we aren't running from our past. This is about running towards a future, a future that includes the apps of today. It's why Facebook, the product isn't getting rebranded. Instagram isn't getting rebranded, but the company is about more than just social media. So this is about certainly acknowledging where we've come from, but also thinking about the future. Uh, the thing that resonates the most with me is if we were trying to run from the past, I don't think we would have gone through with a rebrand like this in the middle of this cycle, because all it's going to do is draw more attention, not less. So how do you build trust? Because um, I, personally, I would argue that Facebook lacks trust broadly in the, in the public in that sense. You know, we've we've had concerns around elections, the pandemic, misinformation, and these are all difficult things for you to manage, let alone anyone else. But there's a there's a trust perception around Facebook. How do you build trust so that we believe in the metaverse coming forward? Otherwise, I guess there's a negativity around the metaverse and you as the, the lead for this wouldn't want that negativity. So what do you do to build trust? Well, I think the scrutiny is important. Uh, the, uh, the scale of our products certainly warrant attention and, and inquiry. At the same time, as we're working through some of the challenges of social media, as we've learned about them, we know that some of the, the trade-offs here are between speech and different and 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 whether or not people can express themselves, not necessarily between you know our business and and whether or not we can achieve our goals. The way we build trust is by communicating openly, transparently, early and often. And we didn't necessarily do that uh, at the dawn of the, of the social media age. This is what we're changing. This is why we're having this conversation now. These products are not at scale yet. This is a 5, 10, 15 year journey. And if I could have had that conversation 15 years ago when social media got started, knowing what we know now, 
we certainly would have. So is it knowing what we know now that helps us uh, ensure that parents, for example, can have some faith in the metaverse? And we have to kind of use quotes here because we don't know what it is. But, you know, children, um, protecting children on, on your own platforms. You know, there's a lot of questions around the impact of social media on, on young teens, for example. Um, you know, th there's some concerns around our youngest on these platforms. What do we do to ensure that children, for example, are protected in the metaverse when the metaverse, if you say it's an open and there's going to be lots of companies involved, you, Meta, won't be able to control even from what you've learned. How, how do we manage that? How do we make it a safe place for kids? Well, I, I don't think it is uh, our job to control necessarily what people can and can't do, but I do think it's important to have the conversation and to ensure that parents can have the conversation with their kids in the same way, you know, I have a 10 year old and a seven year old and, and they're certainly active on, on platforms. We have the conversation about how to use them, how to think about digital citizenship in a world where they're doing school online and they're meeting with their friends online. Yep. So I think it's important for parents to have that conversation, but you can only do that when you understand how to have that conversation. And that's why talking about it early matters. And do you now proactively work um, with regulators, for example, because I feel like it, that's been the challenge of Facebook is regulators have had to come in in the, in the aftermath of a, a brilliant product being launched and built. Do you work proactively now with regulators around the world to ensure that whatever comes of the metaverse does meet the needs of society as we expect it? We do. We've already begun those engagements early. And it's why before these products are really built and at scale, we can have those conversations. And, you know, technology shifts over time have come often quickly, but we end up having the consequence conversation after the fact. We're trying to change that. We're trying to have it earlier and we're trying to engage as broadly as possible, not just as a company, but with the rest of the industry and with regulators around the world. It, it, it's probably billions of dollars that'll be spent on, on building great things, great platforms. Um, what, what if that money was spent on the issues that we have today? Um, you know, speech is a difficult one to address. There's a lot of issues that exist on social media. You're the biggest social media company with Instagram and Facebook. What if we just directed all those resources into fixing what we have today rather than worrying about what the future is? Is that a challenge? We certainly spend significant amounts of money on integrity and safety. At the same time, our platforms reflect challenges that have existed in humanity and society well before social media came about. So I think it's unfair for us mm. to be held accountable to fix those challenges. However, we have a responsibility to do what we can. And I think it's okay for us as a company to, to invest in both, to invest in safety, integrity for our platforms of today and the future, and to invest significantly in where we think technology is going so that we can build experiences that consumers can continue to love. All right, you've moved from Instagram to Meta, Metaverse, uh, you know, leading the Metaverse charger at Meta. Um, you've got Thanksgiving catch-ups, Christmas catch-ups coming. What are the things you're gonna be telling your family um, are exciting. What are you? What are you gonna gonna get them engaged in around the the Thanksgiving and the Christmas table to you know get that buy in from the people you love and trust most are gonna be the end consumers here. What are you most excited about? I mean, in some ways, it's funny because the last eighteen months have shown us what we've missed by not being able to have some real in person physical interactions with one another. I think we've all experienced some form of video conference fatigue over the last 18 months because this is how we interact with others. And we as as yep. humans crave interaction, crave the ability to connect with one another. And I think that's a, as a baseline, the thing I'm most excited about. Now, what comes from there? Playing games together, being able to work out together and 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 compete in a, you know, a, a swimming competition or a biking competition, even though we're all in our own homes is I think pretty far out, but baseline, being able to feel like you can be with those you you can't be with physically, I think we all deeply internalized in the last 18 months. If you take an Oculus Quest, for example, to a family gathering, what's the first thing you show them? Beat Saber. Beat, Beat Saber, Saber, always. always. <laughs> it just makes sense. The modality just makes sense. Uh, and it's uh, it's a really fun way to get, get, get started. And it, it's a kind of all demographics thing too, isn't it? You can really see anyone from any age making a fool of themselves and having a great time. And I think that helps sell that is is a great example people that might have seen beat saber to say that beat saber could become more interactive um in the metaverse because you could be everywhere and, and playing the game together i think that's the key point is a lot of these experiences today that are are single player or for or designed for one can become significantly more interesting and fun when you're with someone else beat saber is a game but imagine a, a travel experience that right now you can go and do alone but now you can go and do with your friends at the same time 
mate. I appreciate your time. It's an exciting day for you and uh, you've got a big, big lot of work ahead. Thanks, Trevor. I appreciate it.